July 26, 2023. The struggling Padres are entering a must-win game less than a week away from the trade deadline. Starter Seth Lugo did his job by pitching a seven-inning quality start, but the offense couldn't capitalize on their opportunities. <laughs> Fly ball, center field. Sawinski back at the wall to make the catch up against him. Now, it's one thing to barely miss a home run but the inability to drive in base runners was a consistent theme for the 2023 Padres, a theme they were desperate to overcome. However, if there was one thing this team could do better than most, it was get on base, which is what they did in the ninth inning to load the bases for superstar Juan Soto. To say Soto was under high pressure is an understatement. One method you could use to quantify the pressure of a particular event is using a stat called leverage index, where 1.0 represents a neutral situation. The further this number strays from one, the higher the pressure goes. For Juan Soto, the leverage index of this at bat was 7.38, the fourth highest of his career. Well, in typical Juan Soto fashion, he drew a walk, bringing the deficit it to one run. Up to bat next was Taylor Colway, a 2016 21st round pick who made his MLB debut a week earlier. With a leverage index of 8.91, this was by far the highest pressure situation he'd ever been in. Unfortunately, he never made it to fair territory. Now, with two outs and the bases loaded, the game fell on the shoulders of Trent Grisham. What was the leverage index? 10.83. The pressure of this moment filled the whole stadium. Both the players in the dugout and the fans in the stands were itching for a big moment. Another 2-2 pitch from Bednar. He struck him out! But it wasn't meant to be. Falling short in high pressure situations wasn't new for the 2023 Padres, but this was a considerable low point. Throughout the entirety of 2023, only seven Padres at bats had a leverage index of seven or more. Three of them were in this game, but ultimately the team crumbled under the pressure. There are many words to describe the 2023 Padres. Disappointing, disastrous, failure, or perhaps the most encapsulating of all, frustrating. And I say this because if you saw this team in 2022, you'd know just how special this team was. Cincinnati, 59 runs batted in. Drury to left field. Connor Joe going back. Brandon Drury now plays. It slammed Diego. The 2022 Padres season was one of the most memorable in team history, and with an elite core in place for the next few seasons, their playoff window remained wide open. Now, that's not to say there weren't necessary improvements to be made. Many players outside of the main core were now free agents, and following the flurry of trades at the deadline, notably for Juan Soto and Josh Hader, their farm system ranked among the league's lowest. As the regular season continues on, the value of roster depth becomes ever more apparent as fatigue and injuries pile up. Thankfully, the 2022 Padres were spared from the unfortunate injury luck that plagued their 2021 season, but they couldn't count on this luck continuing. So, given their core was already set in place, not to mention the steep long-term expenses, the key to this offseason was acquiring depth instead of star power, particularly at first base, the outfield, and the back of the rotation. 
However, it didn't take long for all of this to fly out of the window. Oh, high shot, deep drive, back and go, and goes, yes! In early December, the Padres added star shortstop Xander Bogarts to a mind-boggling 11-year, $285 million deal. Just a month prior, the expectation was the Padres wouldn't be making significant additions to their payroll. How did they go from that to offering Trey Turner and Aaron Judge record-breaking contracts before finally landing on Bogarts? Who, I might add, played a position the Padres didn't need? Well, following the re-signings of pitchers Nick Martinez and Robert Suarez, the Padres actually had their sights set on a different star player, someone who fit their short-term needs. First baseman, Jose Abreu, one of the league's most consistently productive offensive players. However, he went on to sign with the Astros, so with the first base market looking slim, GM AJ Preller decided to take advantage of the athleticism on his roster and acquire the best bat available, which moved moved Kim to second, Cronenworth to first, and eventually Tatis to right field. Quite a risky move to say the least, but the potential of this big four was enormous. And they weren't done spending there. From the additions of starters Michael Waka and Seth Lugo, to DH's Nelson Cruz and Matt Carpenter, to the re-signings of Manny Machado, Yu Darvish, and Jay Cronenworth, the Padres had outspent the rest of the league and increased their payroll considerably. As ESPN's Buster Olney put it, the Padres were playing a different money game than everyone else, which raised questions regarding financial sustainability. Well, as Padres owner Peter Seidler put it, there's a risk to doing nothing. We have a very sports-oriented and hungry fan base, and we believe if we continue to build that trust, they will continue to come. Considering the Padres had to cap their season ticket sales for the first time ever, I'd say Seidler knew what he was talking about. Now, with all this being said, despite record revenues, the 2022 Padres were not profitable. A transitional phase towards profitability is essentially how CEO Eric Gruppner described the Padres' situation. But at some point, the Padres had to pull themselves out of the red. All in all, the sustainability and outcome of this experiment was solely determined by success on the field. And despite the allure surrounding this team heading into the season, in baseball, anything can happen. Well, you guys want to face. Jim to left, back goes Kale. That's the ball game. Hassan Kim walks it off. It doesn't matter because we're still going to win it all. Now here's the cleanup man, Xander Bogart. Ground ball. This should be two. It is two. On to the bottom of the ninth with a chance to walk it off. All you need to do is look at this graph to visualize the downward spiral of the 2023 Padres. But how did this happen? In 2023, 11 teams all had an OPS+, plus, WRC+, plus, and ERA+, plus of at least 105, meaning these teams were above league average in both hitting and pitching. Only the Padres and Mariners failed to make the playoffs. So I ask again, how did this happen? Well, the best way to fully understand the failure of the 2023 Padres is to fully immerse yourself into the Padres fan experience. So let me introduce you to Padres 101. From here on out, you are now a Dodgers hater. You understand that Matt Holliday never touched home plate and Tony Gwynn is the GOAT. Okay, let's dive in. Let's start on April 16th versus the Brewers, the finale of a brutal four-game series. Heading into the game, stars like Machado and Soto were still adapting to the new season, as well as you, Darvish. Well, Darvish ended up producing his second best start of the year in terms of game score. Seven innings, a season-high 12 strikeouts, and only one earned run. However, when Darvish was taken out of the game, he was still in line for a loss as the offense squandered scoring opportunities early in the game and failed to create any more afterward. That was until the ninth inning. Cam lines it into left field for a base hit. And the Padres have two on with two down in the ninth. Fire faithful stand is one at Petco Park in San Diego. That's ball four bases loaded. 
Down by one, two outs, bases loaded, Trent Grisham at the plate. I feel like we've seen this before. Oh wait, this is the exact same situation from the intro, and coincidentally, the leverage indexes are exactly the same. Meaning, both these at-bats had over 10 times the amount of quantifiable pressure as a neutral at-bat. But there was one key difference. Against the Pirates, Grisham never got ahead in the count. Against the Brewers, Grisham was immediately in control and took the at-bat into a hitter's count. <laughs> That was a hittable pitch for some, but not for Grisham, as throughout his career, he's had trouble adapting to high pitches. Perhaps if it was just slightly lower, Grisham could have done something with it. After all, three of his four career walk-offs were on pitches near that part of the zone. Regardless, the count was now full, and the game was at its climax. As Don Orsillo likes to say, It's time to party again. Does Devin Williams go with his best here, or does he go back to the fastball? Grisham strikes out looking, and that's the ball game. Two straight fastballs in the same spot, and Grisham not only struck out, he struck out looking. The last time someone struck out looking in this situation, bottom of the ninth, bases loaded, down by one, two outs, and a full count, was back when Hideki Matsui did it in 2006. However, Grisham was the one who got into this exact same situation twice and struck out both times, which perfectly encapsulates the frustration that surrounded the 2023 Padres. Unsurprisingly, this team ended the season as one of the league's worst in situations that baseball reference labels as late and close. Although, before we get carried away, the Padres' playoff odds were still in their favor. In addition to the high likelihood guys like Machado, Soto, and Snell end up overcoming their slow starts, two key players made their returns in mid-April, Joe Musgrove and Fernando Tatis Jr. In the weeks to follow, the Padres were elite, even beating the Dodgers on May 5th in Game 1 of a three-game series. But then, everything fell apart. This image of Clayton Kershaw changed everything. Well, sort of. After the Padres beat the Dodgers on May 5th, an image of Clayton Kershaw was played on the Jumbotron. Whether you're a believer in superstitions, karma, or just coincidences, you can't deny that the two weeks following this scoreboard stunt was some of the worst baseball this team played all year. The curse of Kershaw began immediately, as in Game 2 of the Dodgers series, Padres fans experienced some deja vu. Blake Snell pitched a quality start, but the offense failed to capitalize on Fernando Tatis Jr.'s eighth-inning RBI double, ultimately ending the day with a loss. A tough loss for sure, but this was nothing compared to what happened in the series finale. Some scoring position, Dodgers. And on a line, Bogarts has the ball. He leaps and makes the play. The Dodgers have left nine men on base. The one pitch, that ball is hammered to left field. Off the bat of Betts, and it's going in the seats. Mookie Betts, game tying home run off Josh Hader. Imploring him to deliver. The fastball is put into left field, an RBI for Michael Bush. That ball is hammered to right field. Going into the corners, he's looking. Soto on the ground, Freeman backs up, he flips to first, that's where Phillips is, and the Dodgers rally in the ninth to take the series. Before Mookie Betts' home run, the Padres had a 97% win probability, but as Josh Hader said following the game, that's how baseball goes. Sometimes one mistake is the outlier. Hader's mistake was certainly an outlier but the team's constant inability to perform in the clutch was becoming more of a theme. Throughout May, the Padres lost a season-high four extra inning games, ending the month with an 0-5 record. In 2022, the Padres lost five extra inning games all season. Combine these poor performances with Manny Machado's hand injury and Xander Bogarts' recurring wrist issues, and you get a team that's treading water. However, this isn't to say there weren't glimmers of hope, such as the resurgence of Juan Soto, the instant impact of waiver pickup Gary Sanchez, and the dominance of the starting rotation. Plus, how could Padres fans forget this moment? 
Line to right field, down the line towards the pole, and that ball is gone! Don't you just love this game of baseball? Unbelievable! This home run on May 25th saved the Padres from their sixth consecutive series loss. More importantly, it provided hope for a team and fan base that needed it. Unfortunately, it wasn't long-lasting, as by the All-Star break, playoff odds had plummeted, resulting in the release of Nelson Cruz and the demotion of Austin Nola to AAA. Although, it was later discovered that Nola was still suffering the effects of a pitch to the face from spring training despite clearing concussion protocol, a situation eerily similar to Anthony Rizzo and the Yankees. As for the rest of the team, the same issues lingered, revealing the larger problem at hand, inconsistency. Through the All-Star break, the Padres' longest winning streak was just three games. As manager Bob Melvin said in late May, success breeds confidence. But the team's inconsistent nature didn't allow confidence to remain for very long. Which brings us back to where we started, July 26th. With the Padres being six and a half games out of a playoff spot a week before the trade deadline, time was running out for AJ Preller to make a decision buy or sell. They decided to wait and play their upcoming series against the first place Texas Rangers before making any major decisions. Well, to say this series altered the Padre season is an understatement. The Friar faithful at Petco Park stand as one. He struck him out, the Padres win! So it's in the hands of the rookie, Josh Young. The 0-2. In the air, down the right field line. Over is Tatis to make the catch of the Padres win. They didn't know it yet, but the Padres just swept the eventual World Series champions. Still, were the Padres about to decide the fate of their season off three games? After all, it was evident they hadn't shaken off their inconsistency as they lost their very next game after Gary Sanchez fell victim to the pressure of a bases loaded extra inning situation. Nonetheless, considering the theoretical strength of this roster and the manageable five game deficit from a playoff spot, the Padres decided against selling. Instead, they addressed their depth by adding Rich Hill, G-Man Choi, and Scott Barlow. Not only did these moves show the clubhouse that the front office still had confidence in their abilities, it also allowed the players to gain closure on this frustrating season, whether they make the playoffs or not. As Joe Musgrove said to his teammates, let's go out on our own terms. We have the control to make the decisions of how things go down for the rest of the season. However, in a cruel twist of irony, I'd argue the Padres lost control of their destiny. Straight away center. Julio going back, going back to the one he tracked to the wall, leaps up, then he makes the catch! But he shows the glove, he shows the baseball, and Julio Rodriguez takes a home run away. On August 8th, Fernando Tatis Jr. hit a batted ball with an expected batting average of 957, a near perfect combination of exit velocity and launch angle only for it to land in the glove of Julio Rodriguez. Out of the 100,000 plus batted ball events in the 2023 regular season, only 54 batted balls with at least a 950 expected batting average resulted in outs. Pretty unlucky for Tatis, but this misfortune followed him for quite a while. In August, his slugging percentage was 163 points below his expected slugging percentage. This was the second worst monthly difference between slugging percentage and expected slugging percentage in 2023. However, this trend of quote unquote unluckiness followed the whole team throughout the month of August. Not only was the Padre slugging percentage difference the worst of the month, it was the fourth worst of the entire season. I've never seen such an unlucky team, said Garrett Cooper. We've had some big spots in games where we've driven balls in the gap and they've just been caught. Now, I'm not trying to completely absolve the Padres of their terrible August record, but considering how well they ended up performing in September, I have to wonder just how much this batted ball misfortune influenced their final record. 
Soto hits it in the air to left field. Back goes Gurriel to the dirt of the track to make the catch. Just comes up short. Still, with all of this being said, the reality was this team had failed to reach even the bare minimum expectation of making the playoffs, ultimately wasting a collection of elite, talented players that may not be replicated again. Now, despite the criticism I've been handing out, I wouldn't classify the season as completely miserable. After all, an 82-80 and 80 record is the definition of mediocrity, but their expected record of 92-70 and 70 illustrated a different story. A record that's based solely on runs scored and runs allowed, the Padres underperformed their expected record by a historic amount. In fact, they became just the fourth team since 2000 to sit at least 10 games below their expected record primarily resulting from an inability to perform in the clutch from both batters and the bullpen. So this begs the question, on a historical level, just how unclutch was this team? Well, both Baseball Reference and Fangraphs have their own versions of a clutch stat based on Leverage Index and WPA, or Win Probability Added. Also, just for clarification, Baseball Reference's version measures teams as far back as 1914, while Fangraphs only goes back to 1974. Regardless, both versions consider the 2023 Padres as a top three unclutch offense in modern MLB history. But considering the volatility of clutchness as a measurable trait, I'm optimistic the Padres won't repeat these struggles in 2024. However, the root of this team's offensive problems stem deeper than simply being unclutch. Let's compare the Padres and Dodgers, the only teams in 2023 to have a team walk rate over 10%. In terms of WRC+, these teams were both above average offenses, but there was one one key difference, slugging percentage. Both teams were built to get on base, but it was the Dodgers who had the elite extra base hit power to drive in base runners, while the Padres were average at best. Overall, the Padres had to find solutions to multi-layered problems, layers that included issues not just on the field, but off the field as well, such as a rumored leadership void in the Padres clubhouse, which players pushed back on, and the reported tension between AJ Preller and Bob Melvin, which ended in Melvin's departure. Then there's the $50 million loan the team took out to cover payroll, likely as a consequence to losing their $50 million plus regional TV deal, a revenue source that commonly accounts to around 20% of a team's annual revenue. Fortunately, MLB stepped in to guarantee the Padres 80% of this lost TV revenue for 2023, but currently there's no word if this arrangement will continue this upcoming season. Even though the Padres had long planned for the possibility of a loan, it became apparent the days of holding a top three payroll were over as it was reported to expect payroll to fall to around $200 million, about $50 million less than 2023. Considering the number of long-term deals already on the books, the trade candidate for immediate salary relief was pretty obvious. One year away from free agency, the Padres traded their best hitter of the 2023 season, Juan Soto, along with Gold Glove center fielder Trent Grisham. While they were never going to recoup the prospect value they traded to the Nationals, the Padres received an intriguing package of MLB-ready and near-MLB-ready pitchers, a crucial necessity for this team, both in terms of cost control and replicating the value lost from their recent free agent departures. Since then, the Padres have added international relievers Yuki Matsui and Wu Suk Go. Although, as the Padres are about $25 million away from the luxury tax threshold, Threshold, a threshold they're very likely to not surpass, I don't expect many more moves this offseason. Overall, heading into the new season, lots of questions surround this team. Is Mike Schilt the right choice for manager? Can Darvish and Musgrove produce all-star level production after injury-riddled seasons? Can Michael King be a productive full-time starter? What can the Padres expect from the rest of the Soto trade package? Also, with the Padres losing their best hitter in Soto, how will the trio of Tatis, Machado, and Bogarts perform? 
Can catcher Luis Campusano not only stay healthy, but build upon his brief 2023 success? Plus, with Machado recovering from injury, I presume he'll spend much of the early regular season at DH, moving Ha Sung Kim to third base and Jake Cronenworth back to second base, creating a hole at first as a result. Also, apart from Tatis in right field, the Padres have multiple holes in the outfield. Fortunately, investments into the farm system seem to be paying off. This was always the end goal, not to outspend 25 plus teams every year, but to hold a competitive, above average payroll while supplementing the big contracts with young, cost controlled players through the farm system. A philosophy both AJ Preller and CEO Eric Gruppner alluded to last offseason. Still, even with all of their flaws, to watch the 2023 Padres experiment end so unceremoniously is quite unfortunate. As Blake Snell put it, it definitely sucks and it's something that looking back when we're all old, it's gonna be one that stings because I don't know that I'll ever play on a team that's this talented and this good. However, it's especially unfortunate because there was one person who more than anyone wanted to see this team win a championship. And now, they can't. And last, certainly not least, a man who has absolutely changed the course of this community. He is the owner of the San Diego Padres. Peter Seidler is with us. On November 14th, 2023, it was announced that Padres owner Peter Seidler had passed away. He was 63. Seidler, who was born into the legendary O'Malley family, the former owners of the Dodgers, rose to prominence in the San Diego community in 2012 when he and a local businessman, Ron Fowler, led a group to purchase the Padres. Regarded by Fowler as the most positive person he'd ever known, Seidler was unlike any owner in pro sports. As a two-time survivor of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, Seidler had long established himself as a fighter, carrying this trait in his devotion to addressing homelessness around San Diego. Along with his involvement in local organized efforts, often he'd walk around the coast at nighttime, interacting with those in need as he sought to understand the struggles of an ever-growing community. Then, of course, there was his impact on the baseball field. In short, he wanted nothing more than to bring a championship to San Diego. Swing and a miss, he struck him out for the first time in 14 years. The San Diego Padres have clinched their spot in the postseason. Once Seidler became the controlling owner following the 2020 season, team payroll reached levels Padres fans could have never imagined. I kind of like spending money. You can't take it with you. That's what Seidler said after the team's 2022 playoff run as he felt an even stronger obligation to bring Padres fans a championship not only creating lifelong fans, but adding to the book of countless memories his expenditures had created. Personally, what I will never forget about 2022 is attending my first playoff game, Game 2 of the NLCS, the forgotten comeback of the playoff run. I will never forget how loud Petco Park was, knowing that without Peter Seidler, it wouldn't have been possible. He's forever raised the expectations for San Diego baseball, but the end goal remains the same, winning the first championship in franchise history. Unfortunately, it just wasn't meant to be in 2023. But as much as it may seem like it, the Padres' future is far from dire. With the creation of a more balanced roster, I believe they could end the year as a wildcard team. And as we all know, once you're in the playoffs, anything can happen. As Peter Seidler said not too long ago, one year soon, the baseball gods will smile on the San Diego Padres and we will have a parade. Well, if those baseball gods bestow the Padres with a championship, Seidler will be smiling along with them. As all of you know, we, you know, all these seasons are roller coasters, and I think we enjoy the ups more than the downs, but we embrace the downs and build it back up. We've got a terrific 
really terrific group of young men. But to me, it all comes down to the fans and the players. The relationship between the fans and the players is really special in this city. It's like nowhere else. And we're going to do it together.